So today I have two objectives. The, the first is to get everyone in this room leaving talking about advanced robotics. Partially a selfish objective here, I want to make the Waterloo region a cluster for robotics. I think we are the right region to do it. I don't think we're doing enough. So every single one of you needs to leave this room jazzed about robotics. That's my objective number one. The second objective is to share with you a little bit of some of the challenges that we faced as we started our advanced robotics company um, before hardware was the new software. And so a lot of challenges arose out of that. Aptly, I titled this presentation, The Robots Are Coming Because They Are, and You All Need to Be Ready For It. I'm really excited because robotics now is being profiled by analysts. When we started our company, that didn't exist for us. It wasn't a luxury when we were talking to investors about the potential that the robotics market had. We were the first class of mechatronics engineers to graduate from the University of Waterloo. We were the crazy ones. There weren't mechatronics engineers before us. So I wanted to engage you in a little bit of uh, thought exercise here. McKinsey, a, a very well-known strategic consulting firm, has started profiling robotics. I just gave away a little bit here. Anyways, in their most recent report, they put out 12 of the disruptive technologies to watch for the next generation of technological disruption. There are 12, and just take a moment to think about what some of these items might be. So we've kind of got a, a family feud uh, style board up on the uh, display. I'm not actually going to hand out buzzers and give away prizes or anything. I just wanted to get you thinking about what are the next disruptive technologies to hit the market. <laughs> Robotics may or may not be on the list. I won't give it away. I wanted to give away some of the freebies. These ones, everyone knows. I mean, they're, they're the big ones. They're, they're all around. And so mobile internet, the internet of things, cloud technology, those should not come as any, any surprise. Renewable energy and energy storage as well. Interestingly, advanced robotics and autonomous vehicles took two of the 12. So advanced robotics, in my opinion, and my definition of robotics, actually took two of the spots of the 12 disruptive technologies to watch, according to McKinsey. This is remarkable because it is one of the only technologies on this list that takes two spots, and yet it is so seldomly spoken about in uh, connection with cloud technology and mobile internet and the internet of things. So we're here today to talk about advanced robotics, and I'll talk briefly about autonomous vehicles because that's more the core area that uh, ClearPath is, uh, is focusing. So the advanced robotics market, is uh, poised for disrupting a, a huge market. So the robots that are coming out onto the market today are in the 75 to 85 percent lower price point than traditional industrial robotic systems. This opens up massive market opportunities for robots to automate problems that previously were just not economically viable to do so. In that category, there are 320 million manufacturing workers this represents about 12% of the global workforce. This is a category that is ripe for disruption. Six trillion dollars is the uh, annual global amount attributable to this percent of the global economy. And a subsegment of that would be surgical robotics. So advanced robotics also applies to medical. Esan will be speaking in a little while about 3D printing as it pertains to medical, and, and this is an area where advanced robotics is getting involved as well. And then autonomous vehicles. In 2004, right around the time that we were starting to study mechatronics engineering at the university, the DARPA uh, Defense Advanced Research Program, this is the group in the US that uh, is credited with inventing the internet. These are the guys who invest lots and lots of money in the moonshot technologies, started the DARPA, uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge. So the, the challenge here was to drive 150 miles across the Mojave Desert completely robotically. That year, the leader traversed seven miles. That was the best of the best that an autonomous vehicle could drive in 2004. Ten years later, we've got the Google driverless car that has run 300,000 kilometers with a single accident, and that one accident is attributable to a human. 
In this market, there are a billion cars, and the automotive industry is $4 trillion annually. Each of these markets, whether it's the manufacturing worker economy, the medical, uh, the surgery market, or the automobile industry, these are all trillion dollar industries that are ripe for disruption using advanced technology, particularly robotics. These markets are underserved, and I put this chart up. Um, it came from the same report from uh, McKinsey. It's, it's alarming to me. This is um, it's hype versus impact. So it's correlating between the amount of times you hear about these technologies versus the amount of impact that these technologies will have in the global economy. And I've highlighted advanced robotics. It is one of the biggest impact items on this entire list, and yet it's near the bottom on the hype scale. People aren't talking about advanced robotics enough, and you need to leave this room telling people about it because it will change everything. Advanced robotics, um, to put a, a dollar amount in terms of the addressable market size, in order to achieve the economic gains that McKinsey is forecasting, will be a 200 to $400 billion market, total addressable in 2025. That is a, a massive industry, and there is so much opportunity. So just a, another uh, quick chart here. I don't want to bore people with charts, but this was put out by Gardner. This is their, their hype cycle. So I, I'm not going to talk about the hype cycle and what that actually means, but I did want to call out advanced robotics, again, or mobile robots and autonomous vehicles, again, on this chart, um, on the increase. But what's most important here is to look at what they're comparing it against and all of the other items that are on this list. So you have... 3D printing and the Internet of Things and big data, cloud computing, they're, they're putting mobile robots and driverless cars on the same chart as cloud computing. That should signal something in terms of what this industry has to, to potentially become. So that's a, a little overview of, of why we wake up in the morning and why we're so excited to, to tackle this industry. I'll give you a little bit of what ClearPath is all about. Our vision is to automate the world's dullest, deadliest, and dirtiest jobs with mobile robots. And so we see dull, dirty, and deadly jobs all the time. Our focus is mining, defense, agriculture, environment. We, we focus on the industrial segments because the industrial segments have very tangible pain points with very tangible um, business cases that you can apply to deploying automation and achieving a return at, at a specific break-even period. We started in 2009, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Our team now is at 45, we're planning to grow to 80 by the end of the year, so very rapid growth in response to this demand. Pearl mentioned that we've shipped 1,000 robots. As of last year, we're, we're planning to, to scale our organization up to accommodate tens of thousands. And, uh, and Pearl also mentioned a little bit about the scale of our operation, so we, we've got customers globally and, and growing very quickly. So I'll talk a little bit about ClearPath and, and how we got started. So in 2003, I entered into the University of Waterloo, and uh, the program was called Mechatronics Engineering. I chose it because it sounded the hardest of any of the programs that were available from any of the universities. And credit should be given to the University of Waterloo because they were innovators in releasing this program in 2003, years before the next university would release a mechatronics engineering program. So 2003 is when I got introduced to mechatronics engineering. By 2005, I was building robots for fun in my spare time through the University of Waterloo robotics team. So this was student competitions. We were competing in international challenges to build robots to accomplish specific objectives. By the time we hit our fourth year design project, we focused on building a small, low-cost robot that could operate in a swarm to map and inform demining operations to help landmine clearance um, internationally, both military and, and humanitarian. Through all of this, in, in what we call the wonder years in our history, we developed an irrational love for robots. And I wanted to just touch on a couple of, of key points in terms of what commercialization um, ingredients are necessary for advanced robotics, and I think passion is definitely required. It, it is not um, an easy 
it's not an easy go. So you need to be passionate about it to just get up in the face of resistance and opposition and just keep flogging on it. So then we hit uh, the startup phase. So we graduated and Pearl mentioned we, we decided that we were going to start a company. So we enrolled into the uh, Conrad Center. At the time, it was uh, just the Center for Business, Entrepreneurship and Technology before it had um, sponsorship. And the idea was landmine clearance, but we, we had a really hard time with that. So then we just said, well, okay, let's back up a second. How do we get paid to build robots? So after we had that pivot, we sold a, a robot to the University of Waterloo. The University of Waterloo was our first customer. They were our customer before we graduated from the university. We had a check from them when for the last five years or six years we had been giving them checks. So we joke around now that that was our uh, tuition dividend. And it wasn't until we had our first purchase order that we incorporated the business. We knew that it, it was a signal to us. If we could convince one person to give us money in return for a robot, then we could probably do it more than once. But we had to get that first proof point. And so we, we incorporated the business a couple of weeks after. And there were four business partners. We each put five, 50 bucks into the business. So we started with, with 200 bucks and, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, hopes and dreams. Then we, we entered into the Accelerator Center, and um, this was before, the, before Velocity and the Tannery and, and all of these elements of the ecosystem that had come online for accommodating hardware. We were a robotics company in a center designed for software companies. In the evenings, we would take over the meeting rooms and set up full assembly lines, and in the morning get in trouble because there was grease spots on the boardroom tables. We had our inventory storage in the hallways, and uh, we had to always challenge the accelerator center to let us take up more and more space. We were flat broke, and because of that, we had to bootstrap. And this instilled in us the second, I think, most important lesson for a hardware company and, and for an advanced robotics company is frugality. It's very expensive to build robots. You can't control Z a mistake. You need to spin up a new robot, and that costs thousands of dollars. We relied very heavily on the, the, um, the mentors and advisors that we were surrounded by in the Accelerator Center, and they were a critical aspect of our success. I would recommend to anybody who's starting a business to, to get mentors and advisors and plug yourself into an incubator. It's, it's very uh, important. And then we had a very simple formula from that point forward. Fight, kick, scream, purchase order, repeat. And so we were just flogging on trying to get purchase orders. And by the time we were five or six months old, we had five or six purchase orders. We were averaging about one purchase order per month. We hadn't even built our first robot. So by 2010, we, uh, we approached some angel investors that were affiliated with the Accelerator Center. And even though we had this really abstract robotics concept and we were really excited to share it with them, nobody wanted to touch hardware with a 10-foot pole. What we did have was purchase orders, and that made it real. And it wasn't purchase orders from you know, Joe down the block. These were top tier academic institutes. We had University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, McMaster University, York University. We were just kind of sprawling out from our base at Waterloo. And uh, to Waterloo's credit, part of our sales pitch was, hey, uh, the University of Waterloo, when they need advanced robotic systems, they come talk to ClearPath. If you want advanced robotic systems, you should talk to ClearPath. And so finding that benchmark or that, that um, marquee client really helped build the trust that we needed to secure more and more orders. The angel investment allowed us to hire our first, our first employees. And, and from there, it was fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. We were iterating very quickly. We were building robots, and they were horrible robots. We still have some of them at our office. They're now office furniture. We have a coffee table and a lamp. Um, but, I mean, it had hot glue and duct tape and Velcro on the inside, definitely not what you would consider production equipment. But what it did allow us to do was focus on developing customers and not developing products. We didn't know what the market needed. We, we needed to hear from our customers and develop the relationships and have them tell us what they needed. So instead of this product development philosophy, we took a customer development philosophy that we... Uh, 
philosophy that we still use to this day and is a very, very important aspect to how we think about building robots and conceiving robots. From that point forward, it was sort of the, the rocky years from 2010 to 2012. We were just still figuring ourselves out. Running a hardware business is very chunky from a cash flow perspective and from a revenue perspective. So tight cash flow management, tight operations, and P&L guidance were important in order for us to get going. But then something clicked. We hit, we hit a critical mass, and we started going really big. Um, we started in the academic market, and, and through selling to academics, we were then able to sell to their industrial partners. So the University of Toronto was one of our first customers. They've been working with the Canadian Space Agency for a very, very long time, and quickly we developed a relationship with the CSA. So now CSA is using our robotic systems to develop new generation lunar rover capabilities. It was that exact same pattern that we were able to repeat in all of the industrial partnerships that our academic researchers have. So we've expanded from academic research into industrial research and to government research. What's next? We, we have a, a global network of world-class robotics researchers that we plan to rely on very heavily as we expand out into these billion-dollar markets that we were describing. Most exciting for us is the fact that market timing is right. We have access to capital. It's, it's not market risk. We've proven that people want the robots that we are building. It's scaling it up, building better and better technology. So bigger, faster, stronger growth. And the reason why you should think about starting a robotics company is because investments are starting to happen, exits are starting to happen, the market is starting to consolidate. So ClearPath is, is very optimistic in the years to come. And here's a, a handful of companies that have had very, very notable exits, not just with respect to robotics, but with respect to any exit. In 2012, Kiva Systems was acquired by Amazon for $780 million in cash. This is the second largest acquisition in Amazon's history, and it was a robotics company. Last year, Google put robotics on the map when they announced out of nowhere that they had acquired eight robotics companies. Boston Dynamics, the one on the screen, was the, the most notable one. But think about that. Google, in all of its resources, is deciding to make significant investments in robotics. It's still open to speculation what they're doing, but we're very excited to find out. So my, my call to action to you is to start a robotics company. The time is now, and we can all work on making the Waterloo region a cluster for advanced robotics and mechatronics. Thank you.